Many of you know we got the comic book solicitation for DC and Marvel at the end of last week. And normally yesterday, I would have started a solicitation video. Unfortunately, my, my boys are a little bit sick right now. So I'm having to kind of catch up. But we've got them here today. These videos are normally a little bit longer. So grab yourself a Snapple. Maybe pop you one of those Coors Lights. If you're here in the Philippines, grab a Sam Mig Light. And let's have a little bit of fun. We're going to talk about one overarching theme about the Marvel August 2022 solicitations. We're also going to hit up the numbers. How much are you going to pay if you're a spider bait babe? What if you want all those number one issues? Maybe you're a speculator. How much is it going to cost you? What does Marvel Comics look like in August 2022? And then I'm going to go through the entire solicitations themselves, point out the stuff that I think is interesting. I'll have my lead pipe lock of the month, and I'll make fun of a lot of really bad comic books. So let's get right to it. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I've noticed this. Axe Judgment Day, Avengers, X-Men, and Eternals is starting to get out of hand. In fact, we're getting 12 issues associated with Axe Judgment Day in August of 2022. That is a lot of comic books. It's going to cost you a lot of money. Axe Judgment Day is Marvel's big summer event, and after spending all of July with the X-Men in a series of tie-ins, the publisher is previewing the solicitations for its August Judgment Day tie-ins. August Axe Judgment Day books are once again heavily X-Men oriented, but the crossover is finally bringing in the Avengers, Spider-Man, and Fantastic Four as well for their own forays into the big summer event. Whoa, a big summer event where Marvel Comics is going to tie everything into this one event that probably not many people were asking for. I can understand maybe Avengers versus X-Men, but we've already done that. Throwing the Eternals in there because it's a Kieran Gillen thing doesn't exactly whet the appetite. But they are going hot and heavy, and we're getting the Spider-Man tie-in. Of course, we knew that was happening because we had seen that Moira X, now Moira Robot X, is going to potentially skid Mary Jane alive and wear her to the Hellfire Gala, thus starting off this big conflict. We know the mutants are now deviants in the eyes of the Eternals, and it doesn't feel like Marvel has earned this. You know what I mean? A big old tie-in like this, it feels like you should be moving toward it. People should be really excited. I think people are reading some Marvel comics, and I think they're definitely excited for Banner of War going on right now, and they're kind of excited for Devil's Raid. Obviously, you throw the Avengers and X-Men, it's going to bring a little bit of excitement just to it, but this doesn't feel very earned, and it feels kind of like it's just a cash grab, which, it, you know, let's be honest, it probably is. I don't think this event needs to be this big, and I imagine because of how big it has gotten and the creators involved, it is going to be a big old letdown. Marvel has also released solicitation information for the main series of Acts Judgment Day 3 and 4, respectively, which establish exactly what Judgment Day means as part of the event title. According to those solicitations, the Celestial Progenitor will arise and pass judgment over all people of Earth, weighing their past misdeeds and actions to determine their worth. Feels like we're probably going to get a lot of retcons, you know what I mean? Let's retcon the Fantastic Four, let's retcon the Spider-Man, let's retcon the X-Men, because, you know, it's Kieran Gillen, and he's important enough to warrant destroying a bunch of Marvel Comics history and characters and lore and whatnot. If you're excited about this, I'm excited for you. I'm just a bit overwhelmed. These events are nonstop, and it's hard to get excited for something like this. It doesn't feel like they really built to it anywhere but in Eternals, which I don't really care for. I tried to read the first issue. I thought it was really boring. I know some people said, Wes, you're missing out. Am I really missing out? I don't know that I'm missing it. You know what I'm saying? I feel like I'm invested in all the decent Marvel comic books that I can and far too many of the bad ones that I want to. And if we look at Axe Judgment Day by the numbers, 12 new comic books, many of them tying directly into the X-Men franchise. Six of them are X-Men tie-ins. That is 16% of all new comics from Marvel. If you are an Axe Judgment Day fanatic, you got to have the whole damn event. It's going to cost you $50 or on average $4.16 per issue, which actually isn't all that bad when you look at some of the other Marvel numbers. It's too big, it's far too bloated, and it has already gotten out of hand. Are you excited for the next 40-issue event for Marvel Comics? I'm not. I hope you are. Now let's look at Marvel Comics by the rest of the numbers, which is a big month. It's a five-release week month. We're getting five Wednesdays in that bad boy we're getting 73 new comic books and only eight number one issues, which is remarkably small for Marvel Comics. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that all the number ones associated with Judgment Day had already come out. 11% of all new Marvel Comics in August of 2022 will be number one issues for a total of $44 or on average $5.50 per issue. 
So you are going to pay a premium if you want all the number one issues and you want to solicit, maybe speculate on maybe some hot things coming out of Marvel Comics. As far as Spider-Man fans, 11 new comics starring your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. 50% of all new Marvel comic books will be Spider-Man for a total of $57 or $5.19 per issue. Now that is bloated because we do have Amazing Fantasy 1000 and we are also getting a giant-sized Gwen Stacy, which is like a $10 comic book. So that number is a little bit high because of a couple of special issues coming out. If you're an X-Men fan, you're going to be into Judgment Day. 16 new comic books feature in the X-Men. 22% of all new comics will be starting the X-Men themselves for $66 total or $4.12 per issue. Not bad, not bad at all. In fact, that's your best value of Marvel Comics, $4.12 on average. Star Wars fans, of course, they are taking it easy on you like they do every month. Seven new comics in their Star Wars line. 10% of all new comics will be Star Wars for a total of $29 or $4.14 per issue. So those are Marvel Comics by the numbers. They are definitely over leveraging their X-Men line. They've definitely let Judgment Day get quite out of hand. And if you got to have those number one issues, you're going to pay a premium. But wait till you hear the DC numbers tomorrow because they're beyond ridiculous. They make Marvel look relatively fan friendly regarding their prices and the way that they're releasing their comic books. DC is bonkers. Now let's get into the actual solicitation themselves. Hopefully you've got yourself a refreshment because these are going to take a little while, but we're going to have some fun. I'm going to tell you the one comic book I can guarantee you is going to be good for the month, and we'll have some fun with the other ones. First up, not shocking, Axe Judgment Day 3 of 6, Kira Gillen, Valerio Shidi. The heroes know what they have to do, but do they have to do it? They were smart enough to get themselves into this mess. Maybe they can be smart enough to get out of it. That is what we call a lame ass, and I do mean lame ass, solicitation. That is boring. Decent cover. Axe Judgment Day 4 of 6, Kieran Gillen, Valerio Shidi. The clock is ticking and midnight loves. It's not too late. Enthralling. Axe Death to the Mutants 2 of 3, Kieran Gillen, Gooey Villanova. The Celestial said correct excess deviation. Now the Hour of Judgment is upon the Eternals. Had they done enough? And does overcompensating at this late hour make it better or make it worse? It's always worse to overcompensate. You know what I'm saying? You give her what you got. Don't try any harder. X-Men Red number six, Al Ewing, Stefano Caselli. Do you remember what torpedoed Al Ewing's sword run, which is a, essentially what X-Men Red is? Like, we got two issues into it, and it immediately tied into a big event. And then there's two issues, and it tied into another event, and another event. And it essentially never found its footing, because it was consistently and constantly tying into other events. What are they doing with X-Men Red pretty early on? Are they trying to sabotage Al Ewing's writing career with this shit? Marauders number six, Steve Orlando, Andrea Brocardo. The progenitor has arisen. Now he visits each and every one of us, and we're given a chance to justify our lives. I don't want to justify anything to Steve Orlando, and I imagine just by reading some of his comic books that that is a terrible thing to give him a task to do. My goodness, that sounds awful. Immortal X-Men number six, Kieran Gill and Michelle Banditti. Judgment comes and the quiet council grows suspiciously quiet. An exception. Do you think a man so devoted to the Hellfire cares one jot? Apparently we're getting a big Sebastian Shaw-centric Cabo book that ties directly into Axe Judgment Day. Do you need more proof that this thing is bloated and unnecessary? X-Men 14, Jerry Duggan, CF Via. Are any of the X-Men right? No, they are not. You've already proven that. Wolverine 24, Bed Percy, Federico Vicentini. The Hands Hellbride seeks revenge on Wolverine and Solo. So it sounds like this is tying directly into those two issues. It's like one story between Wolverine and X-Force. That was Ben Percy and I believe Victor Bogdanovich in the very early days of Ten of Swords. They're the only thing in there that was absolutely badass. I don't mind revisiting that story because it was pretty good. X-Force 31, Ben Percy, Robert Gill, mutants have staked their claim as the dominant species. That just means it's time for Craven. Man, we're getting a lot of Craven. So we've got Craven wearing a beast outfit with Deadpool on a stake. I'm not going to lie, that's a pretty good cover. You know what I mean? It whets the appetite. Amazing Spider-Man number 10, Zeb Wells, Nick Dragota. You mean we could have had Nick Dragota as the primary artist of Spider-Man? Why didn't you pay up? That would have been a much better choice, in my opinion over John Romita Jr. Just look at this cover from John Romita Jr. Look how dead inside 
Gwen Stacy is. Let's not even mention the fact that it looks like Gwen Stacy's coming back. Let's see what they had to say about that. It's time for Spider-Man to be judged, and I think we all know which moment in Spidey's history is going to weigh heavily on the proceedings. These sound like um, nostalgia bait. Hopefully they do it well. Fantastic 447, David Pepos, Wad Cabal. At least it isn't Dan Slott. Maybe David Pepos can get his big break on Fantastic Four. I don't think a lot of people would be upset about that. Apparently, this is going to be a Sue Storm issue. And I guess I'll take old Dominatrix Sue Storm as my favorite right here, these ladies. Avengers number 60, we get another special writer, Mark Russell with Greg Land. This sounds highly skippable. Mark Russell sucks ass. I don't know why you would even give him a special issue on anything important. Fortnite X Marvel Zero War number three of five, Christos Gage, Donald Muster, Sugio Davila. I don't know if these are good. I don't really care. It's not my thing. But you are getting a fourth issue as well. The covers look fine. Amazing Fantasy 1000. I already did a big video on this one. Neil Gaiman, Armando Iannucci, Jonathan Hickman, Dan Slott, Hoche Anderson, Kurt Busiek, Anthony Falcone, Rainbow Ruel, and more. Just think about the names missing from that list if you wanted to celebrate 60 years of Spider-Man. Like the names of people still living. Absolutely atrocious, if you ask me. Ultraman, the mystery of the Ultra 7, number one. Kyle Higgins and Matt Groom. Honestly, in the beginning, I kind of liked Kyle Higgins' Ultraman a little bit, but I don't know. It just kind of got boring real fast. I know this is the third miniseries, and quite honestly, this is like my wife's favorite character in the world, but I just don't think he's doing it justice. So I'm probably not a customer, but it's not the worst thing in the world. Edge of the Spider-Verse, number one, Dan Slott, Alex Segura, Carla Pacheco with Mark Bagley and more on art. This is going to be the end of the Spideyverse. I'll be honest, I don't have really strong feelings in a positive way towards Dan Slott in any of his Spider-Man run or work that he did. Obviously, he was on the character for like, was it like eight or ten years? Something really long. So there is some good stuff out there, but I think we should just let Dan Slott and Spider-Man never be together again. Edge of Spider-Verse number two. Get to know your antagonist for this huge story. Okay. And number three, who is Night Spider? Giant size Gwen Stacy, number one. Christos Gage, Todd Knock. This is the conclusion of that Gwen Stacy miniseries that was going on pre-pandemic shutdown. And then when it came back up, it never started again. This is the end of that. So if you like that, this is your one shot. $10 is a lot of money. This isn't my bag, baby, but if this was your bag, definitely check it out. I am a big supporter of Christos Cage. I'll read a lot of what he writes, but I won't read stuff that I just have no interest in. Damage Control, number one of five, Adam Goldberg, Hans, Rodionoff, and Charlotte Fullerton. I like the idea that they're bringing in Damage Control creator Dwayne McDuffie's widow for this to help out with it, but um, do we need more Damage Control? I don't know. It's only a five-issue miniseries, so if you like Damage Control, I'm glad you got something, but... I just don't see myself investing in something like this. Captain America, symbol of truth, number four, Tochi on Yabuchi, RB Silva. The first issue was much better than I anticipated. The zero issue was much better than anticipated. Perhaps this thing won't be terrible. Sam Wilson uncovers a plot that poses an imminent threat to both the U.S. and Wakanda, but Wakanda doesn't want to play ball with Cap. Faced with an impossible decision, Sam tries to do its best for both countries. I don't understand why Sam Wilson... Captain America would ever do anything that would be best for both countries. You would think he would do what was best for America. Kind of implied in the name. Captain America, Sentinel of Liberty, number three, Colin Kelly, Jackson Lanzig, Carmen Carnero. You know, this is the Captain America comic book they don't care about because Carmen Carnero is on art instead of RV Civil like the other one. Steve Rogers tracks the mysterious organization known only as the Outer Circle to a lab in the heart of a volcano where the original creator of the shield left behind a dire message. Sweet. Maybe we can retcon Captain America's shield's origins. Just what we all want to see from Colin Kelly and Jackson Lansing. Daredevil number three, Chip Zdarsky, Raphael De La Tour. With more ambitious and aggressive goals than ever before, Daredevil has started putting a team together. But not everyone wants to be a part of Matt Murdock and Electric Nacho's vision of the future, as Matt and Electra grow increasingly distant from the superhero community and closer to one another, Daredevil will once again be at odds with the heroes and villains alike. Uh, that doesn't sound all that promising. I don't see Daredevil really getting a team. I see him working with, you know, uh, some of the heroes in New York, like a Luke Cage or an Iron Fist or whatever. But I don't see him, like, trying to create his own team of Daredevils. There's already too many Daredevils out there. I'll check it out because I do like Chip Zdarsky's Daredevil run, but this doesn't sound all that promising. 
Shang Chi and the Ten Rings, Gene Yang, Marcus Toe. Gambit number four, Chris Claremont, Sid Cote. Riverboat Heist, interdimensional battles in an out of this world concert with headliner Lila Chady, but headhunters from beyond the stars threaten to disrupt the festivities and their actions will change the course of Gambit and Rose destinies forever. Sounds fantastic. I'll definitely be reading that bad boy. X Men Legends number four, Indecenti, Javier Pena. Mojo's latest motion picture is off to a rousing start, but can Longshot recover his memories in time to stop Wolverine from carrying out the execution of Shadowcat? I imagine it's going to be exciting. Exterminators 2 of 5, Leah Williams, Carlos Gomez. Four deadly X women find themselves held captive and fighting for their lives. And more importantly, fighting to get revenge on the cursing, cursing, cursing dead man who did this to them. Please don't let it be Arcade. He deserves better than Leah Williams. Knights of X, number five, Titty Howard, Bob Quinn. Legion of X, number five, Cy Spurrier, Yad Bazuldia. Skinjacker triumphant, the body snatcher supreme rampages through Legion's mind. A horned god of mischief, Nightcrawler discovers the identity of the fugitive deity at last. Conspiracy on Mars, weaponless. Oh, man, that sounds like a lot in one issue. We'll see how it goes. I really liked Way of X, which would be the precursor to this, but we'll see about Legion of X. comes out next week. X-Men 92, House of 92, number five. If you ever wanted to see the Krakoan era, but art and characters from the 92 X-Men cartoon series, this is your comic book. I don't know why it exists. New Mutants 29, Danny Lord Guillermo Seda. Isn't that crazy? Viala finally writes a pretty good issue of New Mutants, and then they, re- they announce re- they're replacing her with Danny Lord. Second rate Vid Ayala. There are only so many ideas that you can come up with to take a down step from Vid Ayala on a comic book, and Danny Lore is one of them. Well played, Marvel. X Men and Moon Girl number one, Mahali Mashigo, David Cutler. Amazing Spider Man number nine, Zeb Wells, Patrick Gleason. Hellfire Gala tie in. What? Something happens at the Hellfire Gala that sends Spider Man and Wolverine on a dangerous mission all over creation. That's right, the best duo at comics is back. But who are they fighting and what are, well, they're fighting Moira because she she skid an MJ more to the Hellfire Gala, I'm assuming. It's shocking that Marvel has devalued Spider-Man so much that he's actually doing a tie-in to Hellfire Gala. I'm sure you feel like I do and you just want to puke in your mouth right now. Spider-Punk number five. I read the first issue. I will never touch this comic book again. It was awful. Miles Morales, Spider-Man 41, Sadiq Ahmed. Garnage number six, Ray V. Rojid Todio. Venom number 11, Al Ewing, Brian Hitch. Demonification starts here. After the explosive and gut-wrenching revelation of Venom 10, the third terrifying arc of Venom begins in explosive fashion with Dylan Brock at the mercy of Bedlam. Where is Eddie Brock? I'll be honest, I think it's time to, to acknowledge that this Venom run sucks, especially in comparison to the previous one, which was pretty good. I guess the idea of perhaps putting Al Ewing and Ram V on the same book and letting them double-team it sounded somewhat appealing but now that i've seen what exactly they're going to put out i'm not reading this and i don't suggest anyone else does unless you really want to be bored avengers 59 jason aaron javier Guerrero, the legend of reno phoenix and the star bread kid the avengers journey through time brings them to the old west i thought they were doing avengers forever that's the avengers through time isn't it god jason aaron just sucks on this book he's the fucking worst Oh, Avengers Forever. Jason Aaron, Aaron Cooter. Earth lays in ruin across the multiverse. Oh, this isn't time. This is going across multiverses. The same idea. You know what I mean? Get a new fucking hook for your book, Jason Aaron. Or better yet, just leave. Because you, sir, have dropped the ball spectacularly. Thunderbolts 4 of 5, Jim Zub, Sean Isaacsi. The Variants 3 of 5, Gail Simone, Phil Noto. Oh, it's... it's God, this, this just looks awful. Hulk 10, Donnie Cates, Ryan Otley, Hulk Planet Part 2. Starship Hulk has found what should be the ultimate paradise, an entire planet of Hulk-like creatures. Yeah, this, this Hulk run is just dying for me. You know, this doesn't... It's still a planet, planet of Hulk. It's Hulk Planet. Yeah, I get it, buddy. Defenders, beyond number three of five, Al Ewing, Javier Rodriguez. Loki's defenders managed to escape the second cosmos and beyond her. Why am I reading this? I don't care. Ant-Man, three of four, Al Ewing, Tom Riley. I'm going to be honest, there aren't a lot of prospects for lock of the month, so I'm just going to lock it up right here. Ant-Man, three of four, Al Ewing, Tom Riley. In the present, the current Ant-Man, Scott Lang, has been tasked by the Avengers with a very important mission, 
guard the prison holding Ultron. But the evil black ant, Eric O'Grady, has other ideas that may spell doom for humanity. Don't miss this epic journey through Ant-Man's history. It's probably going to be a lot of fan service, which makes me think it's going to be fun. So I am going to lock it up because there ain't a lot going on at Marvel Comics this month. Jesus. Mech Strike. Monster Hunters. Christos Gage. Why do they put him on the worst shit? Jade Foster and the Mighty Four, three of five, Torin Grunbeck. I thought that was a dude when I first saw the name, but apparently it's Lady. Supposedly, she's a good comic book writer. Uh, you know, it feels bad that she got put on this comic book that I would never consider reading. Not really her fault. Janice Vell, Captain Marvel, three of five. This is where the real gold is and likely should have been my lock of the month, but there aren't a whole lot of these out there. I think most of these titles have ended. These are these 90s throwback issues. You know, Gambit was the other one that we've seen so far. Peter David wanted Ramirez. Gettys Vell and Rick Jones are at best with their part. Man, this sucks that Rick Jones isn't a bigger deal in Marvel Comics. He feels like he should be, like, really important by now. And he's just a complete afterthought. I'm glad we're going to get to see him with Gettys Vell. Savage Avengers number four, David Pepos, Carlos Magno. Tasked with pursuing Conan the Barbarian, the cybernetic hunter known as Deathlock. Yeah, they, they lost um, Conan the Barbarian, so I don't think they'll ever find him. You know what I mean? Well, we got Tulsa Doom, huh? Iron Cat, three of five, Jed McKay, Pepe Perez. I like Jed McCain. At this point, his Moon Knight is good enough that I'll usually check out whatever he does, but I could just give two fucks about this one. Wild Cards, the drawing cards, three of four. Paul Cornell, Mike Hawthorne. Moon Knight, Black, White, and Blood. If you ever want to make me not want to read a comic book, just do this. Christopher can't write well, Nadia Seamus. I got it. It's not for me. Moon Knight, number 14, Jed McKay, Alessandro Capuccio. The scars of Zodiac's attack linger with the faithful of the Midnight Mission. But that doesn't stop Moon Knight from picking an entirely new fight. A new arc begins as Moon Knight goes to war with the vampires of the structure. But he finds it a battle on two fronts, one on the Midnight Streets and the other within his own mind. Yeah, I got that. Miss Marvel and Moon Knight, number one, Jody Hauser. I feel bad for Jody Hauser. She doesn't deserve the position she's been put in within comic books. She's not nearly as terrible as a lot of people getting enormous breaks right now. She gets Miss Marvel and Moon Knight and Faith. New Fantastic Four, number four, Peter David Allen Robinson. Yes, please. Strange number six, Jed McKay, Lee Garvin. I imagine this is supposed to be more important now that we know that Clea Strange was in the Doctor Strange movie, but I don't know, that first issue wasn't very good, and I still don't care. She-Hulk, number six, Ray Burwell, Luca Maresca. The smash hit of 2022 rolls on with its best issue yet. That's high praise for a comic book that is not a smash hit. You know what I mean? Let's be honest about what these comic books are. Punisher number five, Jason Aaron, Jesus Saez, Paul Azaketa. Is the Punisher truly the fist of the beast and the predestined high slayer of the hand? No, he's, he's not really the fist of the beast or predestined for anything. He's going to turn all of them. Ghost Rider, Vengeance Forever, number one, Ben Percy, Juan Jose Rip. $5 for this 50th anniversary celebration of Ghost Rider. I think they could probably do more. I'll definitely check it out. I'm enjoying Ben Percy's Ghost Rider series. Speaking of which, Ghost Rider number seven, Ben Percy, Corey Smith. This thing's been a lot of fun. The art itself has been fantastic. So if you're looking for something at Marvel that doesn't suck and you're stuck on Moon Knight and that's the only one, check out Ghost Rider. I think you'll like that one too. Iron Man 23. This is like the, the slow death of Iron Man at the hands of Christopher Kate right well. Captain Marvel 41, Kelly Thompson, Alvaro Lopez. Black Panther number nine, John Ridley, Herman Peralta. Black Panther is returned to the Avengers, but after recent events in Wakanda, Captain America isn't convinced T'Challa's head is in the game. Which Captain America? Can you tell me that? Is it Steve Rogers or is it Falcon Cap? Because it sounds like Falcon Cap and T'Challa are the ones that are mad at each other. When a dangerous new galactic interloper called the Colonialist. Oh, God. All right, I'm going to... Stop reading this one. That sounds awful. Thor 28, Dottie Kate, Salvador La Roca. Man, that is a big time step down from Nick Line. Salvador La Roca just ain't got it. Hammer versus Tongue, Thunder versus Symbiote, Golden Hair versus Pointy Teeth. It's the epic finale of this dark, twisted team up between Thor and Beto. Donnie has really ran out of Thor stories to tell, so he's just doing gimmick after gimmick after gimmick. At this point, I'm kind of tired of it too. Alien number one, Philip Kennedy Johnson, Julius Oda. Now, there is a new artist. Salvador LaRocca was not on it, but Phil Kennedy Johnson was the writer on the other Alien series. Um, but it got just kind of really boring, and I stopped reading it. I don't even remember why or when, but I do know that I didn't miss it. 
So we'll see if I come on board for this one. Predator number two, Ed Briss and Kev Walker. I think I'm going to like this one. I really do like Predator. This could be dope. Star Wars, The Mandalorian, number two, Rodney Barnes. Really like his Philadelphia series, George Jinty. But I don't really like The Mandalorian. Maybe I'm the only guy in the world that just thinks it's kind of okay most of the time. And sometimes it actually just really sucks. Star Wars, Hot and Chewbacca. So I was supposed to be reading this series since issue number one, and I just... I don't have the heart to even crack it open. It's still in my, like, I already paid for it, but I haven't read them yet. I've never been this down on Star Wars in my life. Star Wars, Obi-Wan Kenobi, four of five. This is something you couldn't pay me to read a Chris Cantwell destroying Obi-Wan comic series. Star Wars 26, Charles Sewell, Andres Ginolet. The Rebel fleet is reunited at last in Leia Organa. Mon Mothman, the other Alliance leaders, sent a strong message to the galaxy that the resistance to Palpatine's rule remains as strong as ever. A strong message. Perhaps a stern warning? Eh, probably could have used better wording than that. Star Wars Bounty Hunters 26. If you got to read a Star Wars comic book, this is what I say to read, even though I dropped off of this one too, to be honest. I've just, I've never been this down on Star Wars in my life. And, you know, the Dr. Afro, Melissa Wong, whatever. You know, the Darth Vader stuff in Star Wars at, at Marvel was always just top flight, just like really, really good stuff. And just Greg Pak's run just sucks. He ran me off of Darth Vader suit, so I don't know. I hope they just Marvel gets rid of the Star Wars license and gives it back to Dark Horse. Those are your comic book solicitations from Marvel Comics in August of 2022. Not a whole lot going on that's really exciting, unless you're really into Judgment Day. Obviously, that thing is bloated. It's gotten very big. I would say it's out of hand. But if you're down for that, you're probably going to have a good month in August of 2022. If you want to avoid it, like yours truly, it's going to be tough. Not a whole lot of things out there. You know, we do have some of those throwback issues. We got Gambit. We got Jettis Bell. We got the new Fantastic Four out there. Moon Knight is still good. Ghost Rider has been good. I'm kind of looking forward to that Ant-Man thing. But it's slim pickings at Marvel Comics right now. Obviously, I did mention Amazing Fantasy 1000, a fake milestone, if I've ever heard of one. I made a video about this, kind of talking about it, breaking it down by the creators and all the things that it seems like they're doing wrong on this one. If you haven't seen this video or you want more information on Amazing Fantasy 1000, the celebration of 60 years of Spider-Man, definitely check this out because I got thoughts. I got lots of opinions.